popular Filipino news website is facing mounting legal pressure. The Securities and Exchange Commission revokes the registration of Rappler. Rappler received a subpoena for a case of cyber libel. The issue here is not press freedom. Rappler's boss says a war of attrition is on the way. What she and her colleagues are determined to win. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're tracking this week. Manila, does the case against one news website amount to the Duterte government issuing a formal declaration of war against the Filipino media? Climate skepticism is fringe and unscientific. So why is it that skeptics still manage in certain countries to get so much airtime? What we've got is a fallacy based on fraud promoted by fools. The Italian government has a formula for taking on the fake news problem. And breaking down the happy talk. We're bubbly, happy, and warmly interactive. Getting to the core of the Facebook story through pure satire. We begin in the Philippines and a popular online news site, Rappler, that's long been a thorn in the side of President Rodrigo Duterte. Rappler's criticism of Duterte's signature policy, his war on drugs, and its investigations into his personal wealth have not gone down well with the president. Duterte has long accused Rappler of being run by Americans, which would be illegal under Filipino law. The site now faces a possible shutdown over that allegation. Rappler says this is pure politicization of the press, that the president now calls the shots when it comes to media regulation. Since coming to power in 2016, Rodrigo Duterte has made thinly veiled threats against journalists and hit them with accusations of fake news. But this official move against Rappler takes the conflict to another level. Rappler vows to take the case to the Supreme Court if it has to. And should that happen, we're sure to learn a lot about the media, politics, and power in the age of Duterte. Our starting point this week is Manila. Why are we targeted? Because we're journalists who ask tough questions. Uh, we've done uh, investigative reports on key facets of this administration, starting with the drug war of President Duterte and the online social media propaganda machine and how that forms the bedrock of disinformation in this country that really is crippling democracy. What we're going to do is to challenge it. And we will be challenging this. Take every legal remedy that is possible, take it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and we're also taking it to the people. By fighting the case in the court of public opinion. We believe that freedom stands for courage. Rappler has posted videos on its own site explaining its side of the legal story. Rappler is 100% owned by Filipinos. There's also an FAQ section there dedicated to the case. Its editors have used news conferences. Uh, this is a harassment case. And freedom of the press demonstrations, again, to get the word out. And they have turned to their colleagues in mainstream news outlets, channels like ABS, CBN, and GMA, to report on the story. As well those outlets might, given the kind of precedent this case could set in the Philippines. They're trying to test the waters if uh, nobody will uh, complain or protest about what they're doing with uh, Rappler. They would go ahead with the other news organizations. And um, in fact, the president has come out with speeches against the largest daily news branch, the Inquirer. And he has also lashed out against the two biggest news organizations on TV, um, ABS-CBN, Channel 2, and um, GMA7 News. President Duterte has continued to lash out against any kind of news organization that exposes any kind of uh, wrongdoing in his government. If we allow Rappler to go down, sooner or later everyone's going down. We cannot afford that and we will not allow that. Um, we've, we've been through uh, the Marcos dictatorship when uh, he shut down all media and then had only his mouthpieces, his propaganda mouthpieces. And we do not want that to happen. Because press freedom is, is not even ours. It belongs to the people. And you take away press freedom, you take away people's right to information. And that's very basic. So you lose democracy that way. The government's case against Rappler is a financial one. Like many companies in the Philippines, Rappler uses PDRs, Philippine Depository Receipts, as a vehicle to secure foreign funding. 
PDRs give investors a slice of the profits if the company makes money, but unlike shares, no control of that company. What the Philippines' financial regulator, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, is asserting is that one of Rappler's PDR investors, the Omidyar Group, run by eBay founder Pierre Omidyar, does have a measure of control over things like the company's makeup or bylaws, thereby breaching Filipino law, which forbids foreign control of media companies. Harry Roque is a spokesperson for President Duterte. Rappler is about money. It is not about freedom of the press. What Rappler did was an ingenious fundraising scheme that resulted in control by a foreign entity of a media corporation. Because um, the business of um, spreading information is vested with national interest, it should only be owned by Filipinos. But the thing is, even the SEC recognizes PDRs, not as ownership, but as investments. And it's not only Rappler. Uh, the other networks have PDRs, and uh, one very telling thing too is uh, the fact that the Solicitor General, who is basically the government's lawyer, asks SEC to act on the complaint against Rappler. So it's basically government telling the Securities and Exchange Commission to do something about Rappler. So that alone is a very blatant uh, government uh, intervention. You have to look at the SEC decision in context. Philippine media has been under attack online for more than a year and a half and just last July Duterte targeted Rappler and then a few days after the SEC decision I received a cyber libel case for a 2012 article that was published before the cyber libel law was actually passed. The government says this is pure coincidence, but when coincidences happen too frequently, they form patterns, and the pattern's very clear. That Rappler, and not a more conventional news outlet, has provoked this kind of response from the authorities is a measure of just how far the site has come in the six years since its launch, and the importance now attached to alternative news sources in the Philippines. It's fairly innovative because this is the first time we have a purely online news organization. It, it did not have a print version. It doesn't have a broadcast satellite facility. So this is the first time that you have a purely news online site and a big portion of the shares are owned by journalists and reporters themselves. So as an innovative project, you would like to have more Rapplers. <laughs> Rodrigo Duterte came to power in mid-2016, launching his war on drugs and drug users. The government puts the number of extra judicial killings at 4,000. Human rights groups say it's more like 12,000. Rappler was among the news outlets critical of the carnage and the absence of due process. That displeased a president who does not take kindly to second-guessing and who used last year's State of the Union address to take issue with Rappler and its ownership. You are supposed to be 100% Filipino. Rappler try to pierce the identity and you will end up American ownership. Rappler has also made enemies in the Filipino blogosphere. President Duterte has legions of online backers, the self-described DDS, die-hard Duterte supporters, some of whom can be quite vicious, posting the home addresses of journalists they disapprove of, threatening them, and trying to undermine the work of sites like Rappler that criticize Duterte or his policies. We did a whole series of this in October 2016. That was what made us a target of the propaganda machine. As soon as we published that story, we came under attack. I was getting hate messages, rape messages, death threats, an average of 90 hate messages per hour. Our best defense was to understand it. So we collected the data and we processed it. We showed that 26 fake accounts can actually ripple and influence up to 3 million other accounts. By April 2017, the key content creators in that propaganda machine were appointed the government. It's online, state-sponsored hate. And it is meant to silence dissent. It is meant to silence criticism. As poisonous as the rhetoric in the blogosphere can be, the government's case against Rappler, based on those PDRs, seems downright pedantic. It's worth reiterating. Rappler is not the only news outlet in the Philippines that uses PDRs as a source of financing. The country's two biggest television networks, ABS-CBN and GMA, use them as well. 
No prizes for guessing where this story is going. President Duterte, while he says that um, he's not sending armies to close down the news organizations, he's trying to kill them slowly, constricting their economic funding, their sources of funding. So this is not the worst. The worst is yet to come. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar today with one of our producers, Tarek Nafa. Tarek, the Italian government says it wants to take on fake news. It's created a new online tool with which to do that. What are the details and why now? Yes, there's been a bit of a frenzy about fake news in Italy in the run-up to an election in March. And this all goes back to 2016, when a network of fake news sites was blamed for influencing the outcome of a referendum on constitutional reform. So this time round, the government has enlisted the help of Italy's Postal Police, which is a unit that investigates cybercrime. And they've created this online portal which asks users to submit a link to the news item in question and then list any social networks they've seen it on. A team in the Postal Police will then examine each case and take action if laws were broken. And if not, they'll try to issue official statements to dispel the false information. But it's not like everyone in Italy sees this as a good idea. No, they don't, because it's a fine line, isn't it? So people are worried about online censorship, and they're also worried about giving the police too much power to decide what is true and what is not. The government says the platform is a transparent and legitimate tool aimed at protecting citizens from unfounded news. But some argue the ruling party has politicized this issue. The director of political fact-checking site, Pagella Politica, has warned of the dangers of turning policemen into fact-checkers since people could actually face up to three months in jail for distributing false information. You've also been looking into Yemen, where a journalist has been killed, apparently caught in the crossfire. Yeah, earlier this week, a photojournalist called Mohammed Al-Qudsi was killed in the province of Taz in what is alleged to have been rocket fire by Houthi rebels. He worked for the private channel Balqis TV and was on his way to investigate the aftermath of a missile strike when he was killed. A local journalist working for Russian broadcaster Arti Arabic was also wounded in the same attack. And although Qudsi's death has been blamed on the Houthis, it's worth mentioning a number of journalists have also been killed in Saudi-led missile strikes. Also worth mentioning, I suppose, that crossfire is hardly the only danger that journalists in Yemen are currently facing. No, it's not. Journalists in Yemen are routinely targeted for doing their work. Last week, the national organization of Yemeni media, known as Sada, released a report that detailed 2,250 violations against media workers and journalists since the Houthis took over the country in 2014. That includes abductions and torture. Uh, but one legal case against a journalist has just come to an end with the release of Hisham al Ramesi. He's been a critic of all the parties involved in this war. He'd been held by the Houthis with no access to a lawyer or his family for five months. OK, thanks, Tarek. Among the world's climate scientists, the number of those who doubt that global warming is caused by human activity is extraordinarily low, fewer than three in 100. However, that's not the impression you might get from the news media. In certain countries, climate change skeptics enjoy plenty of exposure through which to propagate their theories, such as carbon dioxide doesn't cause a greenhouse effect, the planet's actually cooling, or the climate has always changed. You'll hear those arguments more in some parts of the world than others, much more, because climate skepticism in the news media is largely confined to what is known as the Anglosphere. The US, the UK, Australia, and to a lesser extent, Canada and New Zealand. Elsewhere, including the most populous polluting countries, China and India, such skepticism is hard to find. The Listening Post's Will Young now on the curious existence and persistence of climate skepticism in the news media. There are many questions like up what? in the air, like, like what causes global warming? Is it real? How profound is it? Can you reverse it? The evidence for a catastrophe is not there. You know, we're at the low, historical lows for extreme weather. It's all based on a failed fundamental. The fundamental is that it is the human emissions of carbon dioxide that drive global warming. That has never been shown. Across the United States, Australia, the UK, Fringe opinions like these make their way into mainstream discussions about climate change with striking frequency. 
So what we've got is a fallacy based on fraud promoted by fools. What's surprising isn't just that climate sceptics still exist in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, it's that they get so much exposure, largely in the so-called Anglosphere. We looked at a very large number of articles, more than 3,000, and more than 80% of the articles that had climate scepticism in them were found in the US and the UK, compared to the newspapers in Brazil, China, India and France. It is quite clear that there are uh, a strong presence of sceptics in the Australian and uh, Canadian um, press as well. India, world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, there was very, very little climate scepticism there. In India, the prevalence of scepticism is actually very low. Right now, for about 700 articles that I have managed to code so far, about 0.04% of the articles uh, even mention climate scepticism. I've been a journalist in China for more than 10 years. Climate change is my area of expertise, and I found barely a trace of climate scepticism in the Chinese media. There is a funny contradiction that's particularly acute here in the United States, where we uh, hear are home to some of the most influential scientific organizations. And here as well, some of the contrarianism uh, is most evident and most acute. So what's behind the persistence of climate contrarianism in Anglosphere countries? Right-wing media moguls, keen for business to remain as usual, have certainly played their part. The Anglosphere forms the core of Rupert Murdoch's media empire and outlets like Fox News, The Wall Street Journal, The London Times, The Australian and Sky News Australia have long provided platforms for climate scepticism. The invincible ignorance of these global warming alarmists, they've got no facts and they know it. But right-wing media are only part of the story. News outlets with a reputation for impartiality, like the BBC, have also come under fire for how often they present fringe views on climate change alongside those of climate scientists, otherwise known as false balance. Even if there is warming, and there's been no recorded warming over the past uh, 15, 16, 17 years... Well, that, but that, even that's if a, the, uh, yeah, that, that's, there is a lot of controversy about that, no, isn't there? No, there's not. That's a fact. So the BBC has had a particular problem with false balance for a number of years, actually, and particularly with the Today programme on Radio 4, its kind of main flagship current affairs programme, where it just almost feels like Groundhog Day, it's probably about every year or two they'll have another kind of car crash moment where they invite a, a climate sceptic on. The predictions made at the beginning of the era of global warming alarm uh, have so far proven to be wildly inaccurate. And that person will make exactly the same claim. During this past 10 years, if anything, mean global temperature, average world temperature, has slightly yeah. declined. Well, which is it, which is it? There'll be a big round of complaints, the complaints will be upheld, etc., etc., etc. And the BBC is, is now even in the position of actually having um, an Ofcom investigation into the way that it reports climate change due to this being such an acute problem. The notion that there is balance in the climate change story, that climate science holds the same weight and significance as climate scepticism, has been manipulated to great effect, particularly in the United States. The fossil fuel industry there has set out to sow doubt about the science of global warming by funding like-minded think tanks who make spokespersons available at the media's request. CO2, but it, it simply should be now recognized it has no bearing on the temperature of the Earth. There's some members of think tanks who simply say they, they are paid to spend, in one case, 40% uh, of their, their workday reaching out to the media. One such think tank is the Heartland Institute, which has received funding from ExxonMobil, Coke Industries, and the American Petroleum Institute. Heartland spokespeople are fixtures in US and other Anglosphere media outlets. We have always had floods. We have always had droughts. The same is true for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which has also been funded by oil and coal companies. And Myron Ebel, the director of the Center for Energy and Environment with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. One place you won't find climate skeptic lobby groups is China. Chinese industry, just like the media, tends to move in step with Communist Party policy. As far as the party is concerned, the debate around the causes of global warming has long been settled. For almost a decade now, China has been the world's leading investor in clean energy. 
And in his speech at the CCP's 19th Congress late last year, President Xi Jinping himself warned of the harm humanity had inflicted on nature. The official line in China on climate change is it's a very important issue, it's happening, and we have to do something about it. And it's very difficult for journalists to deviate from the official line on anything. So it would be very unlikely that a Chinese journalist or editor would stick their neck out and say, uh, actually, it's not happening or we don't need to do anything about it. Over the past decade or so, Chinese media have developed closer relationships with our climate scientists. As a result, the quality of the reporting has improved considerably. For example, now you often see journalists making the connection between climate change and local environmental disasters. India, too, is home to a sizable fossil fuel sector. And, like China, it has no industry-funded lobby disputing climate science. However, the reasons for that are quite different. India's extractive industries generally get what they want from government, whoever is in power. Pushing back against concerns about climate change simply hasn't been necessary. Climate scepticism in India is not an organised conversation, in that there are not very large uh, business groups, political parties or think tanks where scepticism is being promoted. You have very, very vocal NGOs, vocal think tanks that have actually been at the forefront of a lot of the climate reportage. The frequency of cyclonic storms in coastal areas is increasing. Experts believe this is a clear indication of the effects of climate change. It's difficult to be blind to the effects of climate change. And although climate skepticism has been a remarkably resilient industry within so-called legacy media, in online media, the picture looks markedly different. One of the things we looked at was whether digital born players gave space and voice and time to climate sceptics. And to express it simply, the answer was they didn't. And I think that's to do with their audience, which is very young. And we know from uh, personal uh, attitude surveys in many countries that young people don't tend to be very sceptical about climate change. The influence of online media is growing, but mass media remain the primary source of information for most news consumers. And in that realm, scepticism still has a place. However, as the consequences of climate change increasingly affect the Anglosphere, the pushback against sceptics is growing louder. And although the carbon industry continues to pump money into lobbying and media messaging, the evidence for a catastrophe is not there. Climate scepticism is running on borrowed time. Finally, sometimes political cartoonists can do just as good a job explaining a news story as conventional journalists can. Even when those stories are complicated, such as Facebook's recent announcement that it's revamping its news feed by feeding you less news. The American cartoonist Mark Fiore dissects Facebook's explanation for the changes, which does not even mention the site's issues with fake news and hate speech, but suggests that by de-emphasizing posts from news outlets, Facebook will be bringing people together. Because who needs news when you can have chipper social interactions instead? We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hi there, friends. Welcome to the better, happier world of Facebook. If you were getting a little uncomfortable and, well, sad from all that difficult news, well, you're in for a treat. Our new Facebook algorithm is 98% more bubbly, happy, and warmly interactive. That's right. News, whether it's real, fake, or just a downer, can leave you feeling icky. So say goodbye to news and say a big smiley hello to chipper social interactions. We worked like super duper hard for a few months to get rid of fake news, but decided to get rid of other news too. You'll still be able to get news from real life journalists if it's forwarded to you by someone in your warm, friendly bubble of comfort. You can also go to settings, click source, click the subheading info, type in news backslash first amendment and you'll receive a message telling you how to sign up for news. You should know, though, 9 out of 10 research team members agree that news may make you sad. Fake news, real news, forget about news on Facebook. If you're a media outlet, feel free to pay us extra and we'll boost your post. See? I'm feeling better already.